Welcome all to our uh, webinar. Um, let's talk about balance training principles and clinical considerations. It is great and my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar this uh, this time to discuss balance and invite our wonderful speakers who've managed to join us. And actually, we're very privileged to have them both having two world leaders. Today, we are yet again gathered with people from five different continents, from more than uh, 14 countries to join us to listen to us listen to our speakers and we're very, very grateful all of you have shown interest and have been interested and have joined our webinar today. In the spirit of reconciliation, Her Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. My name is Tore Karari Husman. I'm from Perth, Australia, and I will be your MC today. Now, balance training is an important part of quite a few areas of rehabilitation. So we discussed from um, sports injuries to, to false prevention and, and vestibular training. So really, there's quite a few implications that we, where we could be training. Yet, I find that often we don't do appropriate training or the intensity is just not quite there. And in order to change that, I thought that it would be a great idea to invite our speakers and really start this conversation about the importance of balance training and also to discuss how to do it appropriately, how to have the right intensity and how to have the right different progressions and the training methods. Now, before we get started properly, um, just the house rules people open before those of our, those who have joined us before. Now, during the webinar, um, all the people who are taking part, your videos are um, turned off and your microphones are muted so we can really just focus on the people who are speakers. However, you have a very important task and that is to ask questions. So in the bottom of your screen, you can see there's a Q&A box. So you can type your questions there. Also, there's a picture of a thumb. So with the thumbs up, you can vote for someone else's question. So if you can see something that you are interested in, someone else's question, please put, put you know, click on the thumbs up. So I know that when we come to the Q&A section in the end, then I know that that's an important one. This is the question I really should be focusing on. So I can make sure I ask that. We don't have that much time for the, all the questions, but we'll save them all. So if there are questions that are really important, we can answer them later and then we can publish that on our site as well. Now, the webinar will be recorded. Again, we have people interested from five continents all around the world with time differences. I know, good morning, Finland. You know, you guys are just about to start the days and we are about to finish our work days today. So we will be recording the webinar as well and sharing it with all of you. Now, without further ado, it is time to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Melanie Far Farley, who from Monash University, who today will give us a talk titled Targeting the Intensity of Balance Exercise a Training. How challenging is that balance exercise really? Dr. Melanie Farley is a clinician researcher with a combined 23 years of experience in clinical practice, clinical leadership and academia. She has worked in private and public health community, subacute and acute hospital settings, predominantly in orthogeriatric rehabilitation. Dr. Farley is a lecturer in the Department of Physiotherapy, Education Lead for the Monash Musculoskeletal Research Unit in the School of Primary and Allied Health Care and Faculty in the School of Clinical Medicine, so Clinical Sciences at Monash University. Balance exercise prescription was the topic of her PhD. And Dr. Farley has led the development and validation of the world's first objective measure of balance exercise intensity, the balance intensity scale. Dr. Farley is regularly engaged to deliver her innovative interactive virtual scale training session to help professionals nationally and internationally. Dr. Farley is now leading research investigating the balanced exercise prescription practices of health professionals globally, as well as collaborations with exercise physiologists and physiologists examining the effect of different balance training intensities on balance control and adaptation mechanism in older adults. It is such a pleasure to have Mel here with us, so I will give the platform to her and let her share her article, she shared her presentation. Thank you so much for joining us, Mel. The stage is yours. 
Thanks, Tira, for such a lovely welcome. And I would like to thank her for this opportunity to present this webinar today. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the massive team of people that have helped with this research. I have certainly not done it all on my own and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which this research has taken place. So why balance intensity matters? We have been looking at balance exercise um, for many years and the first studies that kind of contributed to debunking that myth that falls were an inevitable part of aging were actually published in the late 70s and that led to now five decades of research into the nature causes uh, and interventions to modify falls risks and that includes hundreds of trials that investigated the effect of balance exercise on balance outcomes in older adults, multiple reviews of falls prevention interventions and regularly updated best evidence guidelines. However, despite this sustained research effort, falls rates and related hospitalizations continue to increase worldwide. In Australia, for example, the age-adjusted hospitalization rates for falls are and have been increasing um, for the last 15 years by about two to three percent. So it is a problem that even though we've known about it for a long time, uh, we know that our current approaches aren't working. I want to talk to you a little bit about why we think those current approaches may not be working. So one key reason uh, that we think this may be the case is that the balance exercises being performed by older adults in real life aren't actually challenging enough to affect their balance performance substantially. And there might be two critical reasons for this. One issue is that the exercise programs are not prescribed at a high enough intensity to be effective. And we've got qualitative, observational and clinical trial evidence that clinicians can challenge the balance of patients to a high intensity. However, we've also got evidence that this is not consistently applied in routine care. And the prescribing of less challenging, lower intensity exercises is evident across the community hospitals and residential aged care settings. For example, falls and balance specialist health professionals reported intentional underdosing of home exercises by prescribing exercises at a lower level of challenge when working with a client because they were worried about the risk associated with those balance exercises. Now we think that underdosing of balance exercise intensity can be addressed, uh, but to do this we need to ensure that we're prescribing challenging balance exercises consistently in our community. And our research has shown that training in balance intensity measurement helps clinicians rapidly identify low, medium and high intensity balance exercise performances, which gives us opportunities in this space. The second issue might be that the leisure activities that are being pursued by older adults may not be challenging enough. But we've got research evidence that older adults prefer to avoid formal balance exercise training programs and they use leisure activities as a reason uh, to not participate in formal balance exercise programs. They say, I'm doing my leisure activity, I don't need the formal exercise program. We also know that only a small proportion of older adults in the community meet current recommended physical activity guidelines, and therefore uh, we need to engage in a conversation with older adults to help them self-identify if their leisure activities are challenging their balance and provide advice on whether there is an adequate substitute for their specific balance exercise training programs. So why is balance exercise prescription and particularly challenging balance exercise prescription hard? This image illustrates the dilemma um, with therapists needing to navigate uh, when prescribing high intensity balance exercises. Balance exercise, unlike other forms of exercise, carries an inherent risk of falling if it's too intense and falls can have dev devastating impacts as we know. However, non-challenging balance exercise may indirectly cause harm by not effectively improving balance and leading to falls over the long term. So we looked to develop a way for both therapists and exercises to be able to monitor the challenge level of falls exercise programs. So how can we get the balance right? Our team worked across hospitals and community settings with many exercise prescribers and older adults aged 50 to 91 to develop and validate a clinical scale to objectively rate the intensity of balance exercise. 
In creating a tool to measure balance exercise intensity objectively, we've also identified clinical markers of balance exercise intensity that can help clinicians and older adults judge when exercises are not challenging, but also when they're approaching a danger zone between very challenging and falling. This instrument is the balance intensity scale, which has a therapist rated and an exerciser self-rated version. And we've also created this infographic version on the right to assist with communicating with older adults about what higher intensity of exercise might look like. And all of these resources are available free to download and use freely at the balance intensity scale website. So let me show you how this scale works. What I have is some videos here where the individual is doing three different tasks and we've used the balance intensity scale to objectively differentiate the challenge level of those three tasks with the task on the on the left hand side being a lower intensity uh, scoring 32 out of 100 and the task on the right hand side being a much higher intensity scoring 84 out of 100 and the one in the middle is sort of halfway in between and you can see below there's also the exercise a subjective rating down the bottom. That's one way you can use it, is to look at the intensity for an individual doing different types of tasks. Another application of the scale is to uh, look at the three individuals doing the same task and see how does that task work for those three individuals. So if you're conducting a group exercise program and you've got everyone doing the same thing, you might see that like with the person on the left-hand side, it's quite easy but for the person on the right hand side, it's getting to that sort of moderate challenge level of 44 out of 100. And so you can monitor that way as well. And there they are moving. So I'll now describe how the balance intensity scale may help you work to better target your exercises and help older adults you work with uh, to exercise at higher intensity safely. So the balance intensity scale comprises of 11 items representing a hierarchy of what can be observed as an exercise that performs tasks of increasing difficulty. This differs from a hierarchy of task difficulty that you might be more familiar with. And those task difficulty hierarchies are often used in standardized balance exercise programs. What the hierarchy of observed markers of balance exercise intensity is is a recognition of the different reactions that occur for an individual as the task they're attempting becomes harder and harder for them. And so the hierarchy starts with a general noticing of uh, postural reactions such as ankle sway. And then the more challenging that the task is, the more of these markers that will be observed in this uh, relatively predictable hierarchical order with the most difficult tasks requiring verbal or physical assistance to prevent the loss of balance. In addition to these observations, and the addition of these observations is what generates the score for the task. And beyond this point is where a person would fall and that would be considered too intense and it's not the intention when using the scale. Another concept to understand when using the scale when observing these hierarchies markers of balance intensity is that there's three time periods relative uh, relevant to the balance intensity scale which is the pre-task phase, the in-task phase and the overall task duration. This demonstrates the relationship between the balance intensity markers you'll observe when assessing an exercise's balance task performance and the time phase of each, uh, the time phase of the task performance. So on the screen, you can see each time phase, the relevant items for that time phase and the position of each item in the balance hierarchy, which is represented by the number. But the pre-task phase is the point in time after which you've given the instruction, you've told the person what it is that they need to do, and you say, when you're ready, go. And then from that point until they actually start the task is the pre-task phase. And so, for example, in the pre-task phase, looking for signs of hesitation or hesitation of more than five seconds or multiple attempts to start the task are all things that happen before they've even commenced the exercise. But hesitation is number four in the hierarchy. And so that's usually seen during lower intensity exercise performances. But in contrast, lots of attempts to get into the starting position or longer hesitations, they're not usually observed until the intensity of the balance challenge is much higher because they're eight and nine in the 11 item hierarchy. 
So let's look at the way this helps you navigate this intensity safety tension again. So if we look at this hierarchy again, and we've seen this predictable order, and we see that things like bracing and unsteadiness are at the low uh, intensity levels. But if you think about the, um, and we sort of can cue people in to be looking for these things, um, or the therapist is looking for these things. But the critical thing is this pre-task phase. If you as the clinician or the older person doing the exercise notices that they're needing more than one attempt to get into the position or they're hesitating much longer than five seconds. They haven't even started the exercise yet, but you already know it's quite, um, it's going to be scored quite highly on the intensity scale. And so it's going to be a, a more risky exercise to undertake. So that we think is one of the most important cues to help us to understand when someone might be engaging in an exercise where they're at a greater risk of a fall. And if we're cued into observing that pre-task phase and notice these things, then we can potentially uh, position ourselves um, in a way or position them in a way that's going to uh, manage risk. Uh, or we might even delay the commencement of the exercise um, because we don't necessarily want people working at that high intensity for some particular reason. It gives us an opportunity to make sure that people are closely supervised and it helps us when we're trying to target exercises because if you are seeking that high challenge and you're not getting these pre-task uh, markers observed then you're probably not in that high challenge zone. But this is a key thing to remember the next time you prescribe balance exercise and consider where your attention is in that pre-task phase. How often do you cue someone for what's happening to them and then you're talking to the client or you're doing documentation, uh, or you're distracted by what's happening around you. Um, if you don't have your attention really honed in that pre-task phase, you can miss this really important cue. So let's look at how we apply the balance intensity scale in practice. And I'm going to use a video demonstration to show you what this hierarchy of markers looks like. And I've actually chosen an exercise performance that actually scores the maximum score of 100 on the intensity scale. Um, so you'll see every, um, every item represented. So we'll watch the video first and then I'll talk you through it again uh, after that. Okay, for this task, I'm going to get you to stand up on the ball in a spot that's comfortable for you, probably your feet apart a little bit. Once you've got your balance, I'm going to get you to gently move your head up and down. Get you to go up and down five times. That's our goal. All right. All right. When you're ready, go. out loud if you need to. <laughs> okay. So we've done two. Is that what we're up to? See if we can do three more. Get your balance first. We might have done three. Oh. Good work. Well done. Okay, so quite a challenging exercise okay. for that individual. For this task, I'm going to get you to stand up on this the This time I'm going to sort of talk you through as we you, see. So we're getting a little bit. all the instructions. Once you've got your balance, fine. I'm going to get you to gently move your head and oh, up just press and down. I'm just going to turn down, down the talking down. a bit. Now I've lost the sound altogether. Sorry. Five times, that's our goal. Um, all right, okay. when you're ready. I can't turn down the volume, Go. but that's all right. So she's 
getting into position, but remember this exercise is the head up and down. So there's lots of um, delay and organising to get into position to, um, to do that exercise. And I've just mucked up that video. Um, okay, for this task, I'm going to... Okay, for this task, I'm going to get, you to, get you to stand up on the ball. We can remember okay. that. For this oh, task, no, it's just I'm going to get you to stand up on the ball in a spot that's comfortable for you, probably your feet apart a little bit. Once you've got your balance, I'm going to get you to gently move your head. Oh, here we go. We've got multiple ticks. And down. Coming. Get you to go up and down five we'll times. That's our through. goal. All right. All right. When you're ready, go. All right. So it takes her a while to get into position to start doing that head up and down, with us, which is reasonable. So we've got those three, okay. um, three items in that pre task phase ticked. And now she starts to do the actual exercise, which is the head up and down. Cut out loud if you need to. The other thing that we see is that we've got the postural reactions and we've got lots of um, bracing of those arms, holding those arms out to the side. Um, and with the microphone, you can hear the breath holding. <laughs> okay. We can see that the therapist is needing to we've done two. Is that what we're verbal up to? cues three more. and the physical balance cues. First. And also we've had the leg movement and stepping. So we've got the, the postural reactions as well as the stepping. We've got the holding out of the arms, the bracing of the arms. We've had the breath holding and we've had the verbal and physical assistance from the therapist. And overall, the person's looking unsteady at some point during the performance, actually through a lot of the performance. You might've done three. Oh. Good work. They didn't well fall, done. so we don't tick the fall button. Um, but that adds up to this raw score of 11. Um, we're giving it a global rating of five, and you use that to sort of just check that you've, um, you validate your own um, raw score, really. This little ruler down here converts it to the score out of 100, which is actually the interval measure that matters. Finally, we've got the balance exercise of themselves, which unsurprisingly, they rated it as a five. So maximum intense, maximum effort for them as well. So although that was a little clunky, uh, that is a demonstration of how that scale um, would be applied in practice. Apologies for the tech. Okay, let's move on. So in summary, recapping some of these key points, the balance intensity scale can be used to rate any balance exercise. It's actually measuring the intensity of the exercise for the individual according to their capabilities, not a task hierarchy tool. The pre-task phase can help identify exercises that are of higher intensity and therefore will need greater safety considerations, but also gives you an opportunity to change tack if you're not wanting someone to do something that is that challenging for them on that occasion. It can also help you quickly target your exercises to that higher challenge level because you're looking for those pre-task um, things to happen if you're going to be in that high task zone. Remember to clearly instruct the exerciser when you're ready, go, so that you can define that pre-task observation period and minimise the distractions for you and the exerciser in that phase to maximise safety during exercise. Remember that you can use the infographic version of the balance intensity scale to support conversations with exercises about what they need to pay attention to when they're exercising um, and to assist them with self-rating as well. So these are the key references if you wanted to go away and read more about what I've talked about in this presentation. And of course, you can always contact me for more information and feedback. And I will now hand back over to Tura. Oh, thank you, Mel. That was fantastic. And I, I loved having an older person with, on Bossy Ball with actual reaction, balanced reactions yeah. rather than doing some simple and being afraid that they might fall. So I thought that was fantastic. And I've written down my questions. I don't know about anybody else, but there's none okay. yet, but I know exactly what I'm going to be asking based on that. Fantastic. All right. Now, without further ado, let's move on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Alexander Ring. Um, so Alec is the, uh, with the topic and the principles, the clinical considerations of vestibular rehabilitation. Now, Alexander Ring is a physiotherapist from Perth, Western Australia, 
since graduating in 1988. As a physio, he spent some time working in several areas, including in a war zone. He has worked as a senior neurological physiotherapist at the Sir Charles Gairdner Hospital and also joined the Brain Research Unit in 1996. His clinical work uh, moved into the field of balance and vestibular disorders since 1994. Under the guidance of Professor Susan Herdman and colleagues, he completed his basic advanced vestibular training and observership in Atlanta. Alexander Ring holds two adjunct university appointments as an adjunct research fellow with um, Triple D um, and Murdoch University and School of Allied Health at Curtin University. He teaches an adjunct faculty on the University of Pittsburgh Advanced Vestibular Physical Therapy Certification Program. He is a CI on a three-year-old HNMRC grant and on the Allied Health Panel of the MTBI ANZ Clinical Practice Guidelines Group, which is led by the University of Queensland Omar Double F grant. He runs dedicated clinics four days a week in the areas of concussion, balance, and vestibular disorders. His research focus is on ocular motor physiology in concussion during exercise exertion. And I'll be honest, when I did my physio degree a few decades ago, um, there was no vestibular physio. So I've always been admiring this stuff because it's a, it's a it's complete gray area for me. So I'm super excited and also for the concussion research coming up as well. So we are up for another fantastic talk. All right, Alec, I'm going to stop talking. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Tori. Um, really, thank you for the opportunity for being on this panel and, and talking to people about this uh, wonderful area of balance and in, uh, in, a, in my favorite subject, obviously, in vestibular rehabilitation. Um, it's also um, a real honor to be on the panel together with Dr. Mel Farley. I've uh, followed her work for a little while. Um, so talking about the principles and clinical considerations of uh, vestibular rehab, um, we're going to try and go through, in a very quick, uh, short space of time, we're going to try and go through bits of the vestibular ocular reflex. We're going to also try and talk about plasticity of the vestibular unit and how we drive the recovery when the function, when this unit is dysfunctional. And we're also uh, talking a bit about the principles of uh, VBRT, vestibular balance rehabilitation therapy the theories and goals and the approach to that therapy. So quickly recapping the vestibular function um, or the vestibular system that we refer to is really the peripheral apparatus um, in, from the inner ear. So that little blue area that you can see on screen there. Um, and it comprises of the peripheral vestibular unit, which is the vestibular apparatus, um, and the input then is centrally processed in the brainstem with um, four nuclei on each side. Um, and then there is the motor output. In this particular case, we're talking about the compensatory eye movements that occur in a vestibular ocular reflex. So what is this wonderful vestibular ocular reflex that we get excited about? Um, because it is, uh, we, we refer to it as the window to or, or the speedometer of the vestibular system per se. So the activation of the vestibular system results in this, what we refer to as a compensatory eye movement um, to keep your eye, your vision stable. So for example, when, a, when your head is moved, oscillated right or left, uh, you would then see, you would then see the, um, your eyeball shift in the opposite direction to try and keep the target that you're looking at stable on your retina. So if you think of the retina as a screen behind the back of your eye, uh, there is a point in the retina called the fovea, which is the centralmost point where the, the brain tries to keep the object stable on. So if this represents, so with that, you can see um, right in the center of my palm is the laser pointer. And when my head moves left or right, my eyeball rotates in the opposite direction so that the target continues to stay absolutely still in the fovea. So essentially that's the objective of the vestibular ocular reflex. 
it is such a beautiful thing that when you're running at high speeds and you're tracking a ball, your eye is able to oscillate in the opposite direction and you can see the ball clearly to be able to catch it. So when there is an abnormality with that, we try and measure it. And we have, uh, thankfully, due to a lot of work by several researchers and scientists, we have the ability to measure the gain. So what is gain? So gain is essentially the mismatch of the degree of movement in comparison of your head to your eyeball. So if your eyeball, if your head moves 10 degrees and your eyeball moves 10 degrees across, the target remains absolutely steady. So the gain would be perfect. It would be one or 100% uh, stable object. But if your eyeball uh, moves with your head and then there is a recorrection saccades or there is a movement or catch up saccades towards the opposite side, then we would cause that, um, that there is a problem with the gain and we would try and measure that degree of error. And the degree of error, uh, we then proceed to um, try and quantify it on a scale. So we measure the speed and velocity that the head moves, the eyeball, the head rotation on an angle and the angle that the eyeball moves across. And if it's close to perfect, you can see they both are in sync so that the target, like I showed you, the laser pointer remains absolutely still on the fovea. In the second case that you see here, the head moves and then the eyeball tries to catch up. It doesn't do a good job and then it drops back suddenly with a recorrection saccades and then it's back on target. So this would be an abnormal gain. And we do repeated tests of that up to a 20, and then we quantify or we take the average of that and we decide whether the gain in this case, which is perfect, 0.99, close to, to one, anything over a 0.8 or 80% and above is considered okay. Um, and in this case, with this patient who has um, the right side normal, you can see that shows that it's 92.92, um, and the gain on the left side is 0.28, which is affected. So now when there is a dysfunction of that, the, the brain doesn't just sit back and take it. it. It strives to improve it. And this striving to improve is what they use in a vestibular rehabilitation technique. And we call this old idea of assisting the neuroplasticity of the vestibular compensation, vestibular rehab, okay? And it is symptom and impairment driven, and it can be used in vestibular and in non-vestibular cases. So you can use that window essentially to be able to figure out what's happening and use that window to also figure out if they are improving with rehab. So it's a neurophysiological. So this neuroplasticity or the ability of the vestibular system to make changes um, within the neuronal unit is what we refer to as um, the neuroplasticity of the vestibular system. So, so what are the mecha mechanisms of recovery? Okay, we obviously when it's cellular, the cell attempts to change within itself. So we call that spontaneous recovery. And, and then there is the adaptation when one side is trying to um, um, like a twin engine airplane, when you lose power on one engine and your eyes are banking off to that side or the plane is flying off, the pilot then tries to drop the other engine down to level the plane and then you fly stable. So that's the theory of adaptation that we refer to. And then there's substitution, which is uh, utilizing other uh, components. And we'll talk a little bit about all of these. So, when there is a sudden permanent lesion of the vestibular system or the vestibular function, the first thing that the brain starts doing is what it's called static compensation. And static compensation is within that side or within that unit of the vestibular um, um, nuclei. And we call this, the first thing it tries to do is to change the tone. So it's obviously a push-pull system if you think of the twin engine airplane. So if one engine drops, then you've got to um, let's say one engine falls off 
And then you've got to try and fly this plane with one engine. And that's still possible if you do the compensatory changes. So that's a change within the system. And it also does not require the other side. So this is all what we refer to as static or within that system. And it involves a few changes within the neurochemistry and, and the synapses. And it can occur in the absence of vision. Whereas dynamic compensation is what requires head movement. So that's similar to what, when you have the two eyes and you are doing the head impulse test, there's a little bit of, or the little fast movement of the eyes and looking of the head and looking at the eyes, how it compensates. Um, so then in order to improve that system, you need to create what we refer to as a retinal slip. So again, thinking of that target that's on the fovea, when you move your head, if the target is steady, which means you're moving your head too slow, you've got to create a little bit of an error. And that's what uh, drives the brain to compensate. So that's the dynamic compensation. So it requires exposure to light. You should be able to see the target. And you can reassess this with, um, in your physiotherapy clinic with these patients. So we know compensation is, um, is um, affected by gain and the ratio of the eye to he eye head movement should be um, up to 98% accurate. So the brain can cope um, when the target is moving on, its on the fovea by about two degrees, it can still read the target, but if the target is beyond that, it's impossible to read. So we'll do that when we are doing a little bit of a demonstration later. So, so these compensatory mechanisms are twofold. They are the adaptation, which happens um, like we spoke about, or substitution, where you try and bring on other mechanisms like the cervical ocular reflex and other motor responses. So what are the treatment theories and goals that we are going to talk about? They are threefold. Adaptation, again, that we spoke and about how we use that, in particular using dynamic compensation or habituation or desensitization and substitution. So adaptation. So adaptation is, definition by definition, it is a change of the long-term firing goals in the central vestibular neurons, okay? And what you're trying to do is trying to improve that asymmetry between that. So if you've got a 98%, um, sorry, if you've got a, let's say 30% dysfunction, so your head moves 10 degrees, your eyes only move about uh, three degrees, and then your, your eye has to correct. So there's a little bit of an error sorry, it moves um, seven degrees and then it has to correct. So there's a little bit of an error and you're trying to drive that. So the goal of your exercise there is to be able to see clearly at the end of movement. You can use this for um, patients with unilateral or bilateral uh, problems. Habituation is essentially exposing yourself to a noxious stimuli that is, and this repeated exposure can reduce your brain's ability to feel the, the nausea or the noxious component. And you can use this in, um, and, and it, it helps to improve the reduction in your dizziness. It helps to improve your falls risk. It helps to improve, um, and you could see that uh, there is a training affect to it also. It, you can use it in vestibular patients, in non-vestibular patients, and um, even in chronic vestibulopathies. And then the progression of these, again, is systematic. You've got to increase it by speed and range. So you obviously don't, um, like Mel spoke about, choose a target or a, an exercise that's too difficult for them to do. You always see that you try and allow time in between for them to settle. So if they get a bit of nausea or um, uh, problems with trial and give them a, about 30 seconds. And if an exercise that you're giving them in the habituation theory can be performed easily without symptoms, then you take it off the list and you go for something harder. So you should always be challenging the system, okay? And you always reassess to add it. And one of the two most common ones that was started with vestibular rehabilitation right from the 1940s 
and later on with the cawthorn cooksey exercises and the brandt daroff exercises, which some of you might be familiar with. So the definition of substitution, essentially it's using a different task or a different system to manage for, to compensate, to substitute for what you have lost. And the goals would be to minimize symptoms during head movement um, and to reduce falls risk. So the indications for these would be people who talk about self-reported disequilibrium with head movement, who feel unstable when they turn to look from side to side, walking down a path, um, high risk of falls with walking. You can use um, it in a lot of these patients um, and patients with unilateral, bilateral, or central vestibular problems. So the strategies that you develop is, is using things like um, um, sub saccadic eye movements, um, so tracking uh, visual pursuits, decreasing the amount of head movement so they're not oscillating too much, and you will find some patients tend to do that anyway, and enhancing your cervical ocular reflex to become a little more um, enhanced and to take over some of this function. So the treatments that we use are generally threefold. We have gaze stabilization, postural control, and motion-provoked dizziness. The main one that um, might be new to some of you is the in indication of um, gaze stabilization. And Gaze stabilization uses the concepts of VOR adaptation. So essentially what you're trying to do is create a retinal slip. So if you're looking at a target, uh, in this case um, would be like a red target that you can see clearly, and you're gonna focus on the target and move your head from side to side, keeping your eyes locked on the target. Um, if, and what you're trying to do is to drive the error, and if you, have a problem and if your eyes are jumping off across, you're trying to drive that error signal to change um, the, uh, the neuronal component. So, so for example, we call this the X1 or the times one exercises. Um, so let's all look at the red dot on the screen and try and keep your body absolutely straight, focus your eyes on the red dot and gently move your head from side to side like you're saying no and you will find that the target remains clear. And if you start accelerating a little bit, go a little bit faster, you will get to a point where the target starts shaking or blurring. And at that point, you have created a bit of a retinal slip. And so that's driving your brain now to try and improve its system to stabilize it. Obviously, you won't want to go too fast because that'll just give you a headache and lots of noxious stimuli, which is not good. So, the progression guide would be increasing the amount of time that you do it, the speed that you move the head, the position of standing, um, like um, um, Dr. Farley spoke about. Um, you can just make it progressively um, harder. The distance from, from the target from close to, to far away, to uh, about three meters away, the background complexity. So if you're seeing it on a plain blank wall, it's easy. Going to a busier wall, it's harder the target size and contrast. And so there've been a lot of uh, research done in that. And the frequency of the day. And, and a sample card would be this. Um, these um, slides, uh, parts of it would be shared. So you can have a look at those. The sample um, exercise that we would do is with, uh, three to five sessions per day at about 12 to 20, 20 minutes a day, depending on what we're doing. So we do it in the yaw plane and in the pitch plane, and there's small amplitude. And then there is the, what we refer to as the X2 or the times two exercise, which essentially is moving the target in the opposite direction to your head while your eyes are on the target. So that's creating the error signal uh, or doubling the error signal. Bear in mind in older patients and patients who have bilateral problems, it's a little bit hard for such a complex exercise. And then we have the um, gaze shift or gaze remembered targets that are used um, utilizing more the concept of substitution. So an example of gaze shifting would be this. So let's try it. So hold two targets up, hold your thumbs up in front of you. Uh, so fix your eyes on your left thumb Keep your eyes locked on your left thumb, turn your nose to the left thumb. 
Uh, keep your head still, eyes right, nose right. Head still, eyes left, nose left. Eyes, nose, eyes, nose. And that's the gaze shifting between two targets. And remember targets, again, as substitution, but you're bringing on more a central pathway there. So uh, remember the target where it would be like if you're looking at a target, focus your eyes on something that's above the screen. Um, remember where it is, close your eyes, turn your chin about five degrees to the left. Remember where the target is, bid your eyes shut, try and look at the target under shut eyes, and then open your eyes and see if you're on the target. So that would be a remember target. So all of these are techniques that we use to, um, to push the boundaries of this area. Postural control would be um, the next thing that we do. And we do a lot of postural control work um, with disequilibrium, with head movements. And we went through a good example of that just earlier in the talk. Um, the goals here would be to minimize symptoms during head movements and to normalize your, um, your falls risk. Um, and also to return to most normal activity. So some of the principles that you have to be aware of with, with that is that you've got to be safe with your practice. So no pushing them to the point of falls and um, you want to um, make it challenging, but it has to be successful at the same time, which is pretty much um, um, those theories that went through earlier. So. The treatments um, use, the last one would be motion-provoked dizziness. And in motion-provoked dizziness, we're talking about um, the concepts of habituation, the dizziness or vertigo in a busy visual background, uh, minimizing those symptoms with positional change. So provocation of this would be, um, so there are tests called the motion sensitivity tests or the visual vertigo analog scale. You can do some of these simple tests and find um, some of the tests that our patients are unable to do, uh, if you scale it on a zero to 10 scale, try and choose something that's about um, three to five and get them to uh, repeat those movements. Uh, total number of repetitions or maybe three to five uh, tests, get them to do a few repetitions, get them to progressively increase it at home. And um, that would round off the emotion sensitivity. So for further reading, um, there is uh, the clinical practice guidelines that was first published in uh, 2016. And there's an updated version from last year that I'll get you to look through. And with that, I'm going to stop this talk. Oh, that was fantastic. I was just thinking, of course, I was doing all the exercises and I was thinking, this is exactly, I couldn't even go. I went to one ballet lesson ever and it's the whole period. So looking there and spinning around, that was enough. So I went on to martial arts. So I'll, I'll try to do these, these <laughs> ones. Um, absolutely fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm by both of your talks. I think they've been fantastic talks. Now, before going to the q and I'm just going to go because my background is biomechanics. So I, I, I'm really into the numbers. So I'm trying to push out tech systems. And I've been very lucky because I've come from the research background to work with our developers to create something new. So we have our um, smart balance system. So the whole idea of, of us even having that is that so we can have numbers. And I'll show you quickly. We've done a few updates. I've spoken to Alec in the past about his ideas as well. And we always try to talk to people about the different ideas and what we could be doing to make our systems a little bit better. So I'm just going to show you quickly some of what we can do with our new sort of with our smart balance system. So um, basically what we're trying to do, so on, on top of the strength training equipment who has developed this smart balance, uh, which is a simplified small force plate where we can see the center of pressure trajectory. And what we can do in the system is that we can do testing and training in the same equipment. So we have the testing train screen where we can see uh, rom stable and unstable Romberg testing, limits of stability, and then we can also have the weight. So with quite easily, we can get some numeric data of what we can do. 
So for example, if we do Romberg's test, which is normally based on a subjective assessment, so a person looks at someone standing, eyes open or eyes closed, feet together, feet apart, and tries to mimic and see, look at if there's eye movements and different things, which is often relying on the skill of the tester. If we do this on a plate, we actually get numbers. So this is an example of, a, of, of Romberg testing. And we can get the data, postural sway, the biomechanical data, anterior posterior, and also sideways. We can look at the velocity, we can look at the area, or we can look at the percentage between the weight, and we get the postural graph in these different areas. So that's sort of the beauty of the testing that we can create, and we get the data. We can also have a simplified format, which is compared to normative data, or we can have the poor biomechanical data. But also on the same plate, what we can do is we have the trainers as well. So we can assess someone and then we can have the training programs. We can define the training programs as per the client who's using them, which is the difficulty levels and how we go. We have a dynamic stability and we also have then the um, also, you know, dynamic and also um, static balance exercises. What we can do, so whether it's just controlling our center of pressure or it's just actually doing activities such as stepping. And we also have included the new games for in back and stop signal that also have a cognitive challenge on top because we talk a lot about including cognition and here's just some examples of the new games. So we have there our, um, I don't actually see them because I don't have my reading glasses on from Nana here talking. Um, but we basically, we have different games for different tasks. Plus we have the even Mario Karts now, if we are younger people or if anyone else wants to play Mario Karts. Um, so we try to develop our system all the time and really, you know, discussing with our clients as well to say to people like, let us know if you want to have something new, we're happy to develop new games and we do rely on the feedback. So we try to improve our, our what we're doing here and we have the few new games and there's something else coming up as well by the time we get to the Physio Expo in October. But I will tell you more about that there. But now I'm going to stop sharing and then and, and open the Q&A. Um, we've had a few questions there and I know Mel already finally answered, gave a really great answer. I'll just quickly take a look at the question. I was asking, how hard do you recommend they should, people should be working on a BIS self and therapist rated score and Mel has given a really, really nice long answer for this, which we can share on the web page. But Mel, do you want to just give a quick briefing about this? And then we can um, look at that later, considering that was a nice answer that a lot of thumbs up for that as well. Yeah. Can I give a brief one? And then we can share the whole answer to everyone if they don't want to focus on reading. Yeah, sure. So um, the short answer is we don't know the exact uh, thresholds that are the most effective to be training at yet. To do that, we need to do a dose response study, which for those that have had read the answer, it's a bit of an eye-watering one and a half million to do that study with the adequate number of people that we need to sort of uh, show that statistically. Um, and so at this time, all we can say is to actually think about using this objective measure to actually look at what you're doing. Often when I'm working with um, clinicians, they think they're challenging people. And then when they measure it objectively, they realize they're actually never really going past that halfway point on the scale. So it's really an opportunity to sort of examine what you're doing and to use it as a tool to progress exercises with an individual, even though we don't know whether a particular score is the most effective yet that will come in the subsequent research. Oh, that's fantastic. I have another question for you, but I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm going to take turns asking both of you questions. Um, what I was wondering, do you always start with the eye exercise? So depending on whether it's a vertical mania or labyrinth issue or, or do you always start with the eye? Considering if we talk about the, you know, dizziness and, 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 you know, feeling sick and everything else, do you still always start with the, with the eye activities, is that a good starting point, or do you, how how do you progress, and where do you start? So the 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 dose or the exercise choice is very selective now. Um, it is dependent on what we find from the differential diagnosis. So if you do have an injury to the vestibular nerve, like in a neuronitis or so, and you've got a deficit with the VOR when you do the the tests 
then yes, you do. One of the most basic exercises that most vestibular physios will be giving patients is the times one exercise, where, like I said, if you're looking at the red target and moving your head around. Um, but there are other things that you do, depending on what we find, um, like it, it would be different in, in many areas or so where there, it's, it's more acute. And at that time, you're trying to get the system to, to calm down a little bit. So it's really dependent it is dependent or on BPPV, where the eye exercise won't have any need for it. Um, they would have other specific maneuvers to fix the problem. So it's all dependent on your diagnosis at that time or uh, your differential diagnosis. Uh, that's, it's, it's a fascinating area. I'm going to ask you another one straight away. Have you looked at, considering we have a problem that leads into business that leads into force, have you ever combined that you do the training? Have you measured the forces? Have you do a movement analysis to see how do they move differently? Their reaction times, their, you know, you know, the speed of reactions. Have you looked at those or is it all, you know, or you, do you start sitting down and then standing up? How does it work? Have you looked at the posture? Because you mentioned posture, sway and gait there as That's well. Right. So look, postural, uh, postural sway and gait or postural um, stability was, a big deal uh, 20 years ago when I first started doing it when, and we used several machines um, like the force platforms with all the surround screens and things like that to create that amount. Um, and that has progressively, because of the time and money and that goes into that, it has been fallen off. But there are still um, comprehensive areas that use it. So uh, when patients are being worked up for a, a chronic problem, it is very important that postural sway is measured even on the force platform. I use uh, a static platform, as you know, um, and but I use it in the ones that are not improving when I want to get an idea of other components to it. But yes, so it, it would be useful, especially in the more complex patients. Super. Sorry, I'm just always a biomechanist. Can't, can't take that away. Can't take the physio or bike man, my, my sure. mechanics away from me. Mel, next one to you. I was wondering, oh, let me just check. It goes someone else. Oh, perfect. This is good. I can answer my I can ask my question. When you did the scale, did you mainly look at older people or did you look at different areas? Because what I found that we did, I did, I was part of a study where we looked at younger people and, and it was quite easy. We picked up quite easily the basketball players, the young guys who'd done their ankles because their balance was shocking because they, because he would, I think they were bored when they were telling, say, do the alphabet on the wall and here's a bubble board and they just didn't do the exercises. And quite often I find people who have sprained their ankles do not do the exercises. The clever ones, yes, but many, many people don't. Does the scale work for everyone? And does the progression work? Have you, if you had different age groups, did you find a difference in the progression for exercises for the different groups? Mm, great question. And another question that I do get asked a lot. So in our validation study, we had um, people from 50 to 91. So we didn't have anyone under 50, but that was because we were particularly um, prioritizing developing something to use for older adult exercise. Um, and we had people from acute, subacute community um, phases of um, care and rehabilitation and from all of the major um, clinical streams as well. So cardio, neuro, musculoskeletal. Um, and so we had a very diverse population that we validated it in. And part of that decision was that so that we could say that it was quite applicable and it was consistent. So um, it didn't really matter how old someone was that that kind of hierarchy of how things unpack was much the same regardless of the age. Now we didn't validate it in the under 50s but from many many years of working clinically I don't see why it wouldn't still be applicable for people that are younger than 50. It's just we had a, a cut off in our scale development process. What we don't really know is paediatrics and we're actually currently doing a study at the moment um, called the BIS Kids Project to see if we can look at the content validity to start with of using it with a paediatric population. We're actually looking for clinicians to help us with that study at the moment. So if anyone's interested in helping with some research, um, please get in touch. We're trying to, to uh, finish recruitment for that this month. So I think I definitely say we don't know about paediatric population, but I think younger adults 
um, from a just from a clinical perspective, I think it would still be applicable. But well, the formal validation is over fifty. That's fantastic. Um, looks sad. I'm looking at the clock, and I think we need to wrap up. But before I go. Um, but everyone who's listening, thank you for joining up. And please, we'll put on the links for all the materials we have today. So follow through and contact both Mel and Alec if you have any, have any questions and, and really try to get, and I think the Mel's when you were showing, you know, the exercise, I think that would be a really great student program mm -hmm. when someone is doing and then the students can muck it around. So if there's any educators here, I think that would be a good team building exercise and trying to how you mark and because I think you need to be able to subjectively score. I think that's a, a skill on its own. But um, anyone who's coming to APA, so the Physiotherapy Expo in Australia and Brisbane, both Alec and Mel will be there and we're involved in workshops. So I don't know if you can still sign up for workshops, but check out the program. Everybody's going to be there. We're all going to be there. So come and see, go and see them first, then come and see us and we'd be happy to chat more. But Obviously, they know more about their stuff than what we do know. Um, but it's a fascinating topic, and I think we have to get people doing more balanced exercises in all different areas and really progressing them. It's the same as whether it's whatever training, whether it's cardio strength or balance, you must progress and you have to push yourself. And one extra question, Mel, how old was the nana on the bottle ball that you progressed and you had balanced reactions? She's 80. Awesome. This is great. So even an 80-year-old, 80 year old can mm -hmm. um, have balanced reactions. We don't, I mean, of course, we have to provide safety, but we can't be too, we can't write, you know, put people in a bubble wrap. It's the same as we have to let kids climb trees and jump off swings and do stuff. So it's the same thing with older adults that keep them safe, but push them a little bit. All right, I'm really going over time, just by one minute. Um, I'm so grateful for our speakers. Thank you for joining us. I think I'm very lucky that I know really super duper nice people that I can call and ask. It's in my long list of, of people who joined our webinars. And yet again, we've got two great speakers joining us. So I'm super grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone who signed up and thank you for your continuing interest. We've been running, this is now the third year we're running. So this was a my little COVID project turned into something ongoing, ongoing education free for everyone so we can improve everyone thank you for coming in thank you for the speakers um keep in touch um we'll be posting the the recording as well and um send us if you have questions and if you go to apa in brisbane go and follow try to find them and don't harass them too much because that's on me then because i'm saying this but keep up the interest and and let's make this let's make all our patients having great balance Thank you to everyone, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.